Let's bring in H.B. Duran. She's a freelance game marketing and entertainment journalist as well as a gamer herself. I, I think when you think of universities, uh, part of the effort is to kind of stay on top of these shifting trends so that you can train up students for the workplace. This is obviously a trend that's uh, very popular, not just China, but the world. So give us a sense of this job market and what it's going to be like for some of these students. Well, uh, Mike, it's amazing because just like any other industry, esports has a lot of roles available. So as uh, we heard in the report there that uh, some people are looking at game development, uh, esports needs broadcasters, marketers, accountants, uh, human resources, all of these tremendous roles in addition to uh, writers like me um, and players. And those players are going on to take on larger roles as well well, like marketing and uh, brand relationships. So there is a lot of opportunity, not just in esports, but it also translates to other industries. So if we can get young people involved in a valuable career, it's great for everybody. And interest in gaming, of course, uh, it, it's not gender-based. Obviously, you're a gamer yourself. It crosses racial divides as well. A number of universities now getting into the game. Just last week, a university in the U.S. state of Georgia launched a program designed to help minority students crack into this industry. Uh, black and brown youth are, are devouring these games in large numbers, but they only make up about 5% of the workforce developing games. Uh, is this going to be something that you're going to see more and more universities trying to offer programs to help young kids uh, to get into the business? Oh, absolutely. And it actually starts in high school. We're seeing a lot of these programs begin as early as middle school, but uh, you're going to see a lot of things like uh, Play VS or high school esports league, uh, teaching these children um, and teenagers how to navigate the esports space, um, you know, through cooperation and teamwork and communication and um, just like any other team you have to keep your grades up um, and you have to balance work and play or both depending on uh, what you're doing if you're playing for a living and so colleges are getting uh, more diverse and they are looking to include more people and so I think that uh, that diversity starts in high school and um, in college where anyone can join an esports club it spans race background gender gender identity it it doesn't matter if you can play the game or do the job everyone's welcome and we know the industry's big uh, is there a ceiling or do you just see this growth just continuing you know i see it continuing and the reason that I see that is because I've watched it grow personally from uh, just before it was start called esports. Excuse me. Um, there was a time when broadcasters in traditional sports would literally laugh at the idea of playing video games for a living, and now, um, you know, organizations like ESPN are getting involved in uh, broadcasting these tournaments. They're reaching a younger audience, and it's it's a great. Uh, way to reach traditional sports fans as well because there's crossover between the sports stimul uh, simulation games like FIFA and um, NBA 2K. So uh, I, I can see it continuing to grow, not only commercially, but uh, in terms of reach and interest and different kinds of esports. Um, there's a farm simulator game that is actually an esports. So uh, if you could, if you want to watch it and you want to compete in it, there's an esport for you. You know, I have to ask you about the pandemic because the pandemic hammered so many industries, and yet I think most of us are going bonkers, staying inside our homes. And you were saying playing video games. I mean, that's a that's a nice distraction to have. Was it actually kind of a boon for the, for the industry, or, or did it did it hamper it some? Um. It only hampered it to the point of live events. Live events draw huge crowds. They fill enormous arenas with fans from all over the world. And so ticket sales and impulse buys like merchandise and food and things like that at the arena, of course, we lost out on all of that. However, like you said, people went bonkers. And so as uh, agile companies were able to move tournaments online, um, people were able to form new tournaments, form new leagues. Um, and so it actually became a boom. And not only that, but it also allowed companies to adapt and learn so that from now on, the industry is going to be able to grow and adapt even if we can't get anywhere in person. And before we let you go, where is China in all of this? Uh, is it one of the leaders in the esports world? Uh, it is actually right now. Um, 
the esports audience is um, probably almost 60% in China, uh, followed by North America and Europe. So China is really investing a lot um, in terms of the government and uh, the large companies like Tencent are investing in the esports space to um, make sure that it is a viable economy and it, it is sustainable for the long-term future uh, where corporations and citizens can get involved. H.B. Duran, thanks so much for your insights. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me.